All right, everyone. So happy to be with you this afternoon uh, with an amazing person. Super excited to bring him to you. Um, welcome to Practical Creativity. Uh, this is an interview show where we unpack and demystify the creative process so that we can put it to work in our own lives. And today I'm so astonishingly pleased to have with me Keith Clark, who is an entrepreneur, a community builder, and a lover of jazz and so much more, film, etc., and of course, Miami. So, Keith, uh, over to you. Tell us a little bit more about yourself and what you're up to right now. Okay. Uh, I'm very glad to be here, and hello, everyone. So, I've been involved in running a jazz series downtown Miami since 2005. Um, Recently, we had a series at the Olympia Theater in March, and also I had a film series at the uh, Hampton House that also was in March. Um, but basically, I've been doing films since 2010, jazz since 2005. And I basically picked my own talent and the criteria is very subjective the ensemble has to knock my socks off. So I have band leaders that are age 12 and band leaders that are age 93. Amazing. So it's, it's very rewarding finding excellence and then being able to share it. So inspiring, oh my goodness. And tell us just a little bit more behind the curtain. So what inspires you What or what got you involved in jazz and film in the first place? Okay, I would imagine in junior high school that I played uh, saxophone and um, I guess by 12th grade, I wasn't willing to, uh, to put in the time such as practice and perfection. And, you know, it makes you really admire the people who can stay with their craft and give you this incredible improvisation and art form. Uh, but I've always had the great taste uh, and certain standards. Um, what was the other part of that question? <laughs> yeah, just how, how did you get interested in, in film and, and jazz, you know? Well, I think a little bit of traveling exposes you to different communities. So one time I was living in Boston and I think for the first time uh, there I saw movies like The King of Hearts, Harold and Maude, and A Thousand Clowns. And these were like art films that really touched me. And of course, there are many other films, uh, whether American or, or, or uh, international, you know, that are very good. But the thing I like about film is that you, it tells you a story and you see the epiphanies and the transformation of a person. And it can basically give you encouragement uh, to say, yes, I can do this, or I have to do this like this person did. I would say one of the best films that deals with uh, race issues for me was a film, um, oh boy, uh, A Gentleman's Agreement. There you go. And it basically is, you know, when I saw a certain scene that took place, I said to myself, now that's how you deal with uh, racism, or that's how you deal with injustice. You just face it. You just don't, you know, turn your head and act like it doesn't exist. So I think films, you know, have other mediums too. Films obviously give you uh, cultural landscapes and, and they also give you music and they, they tell stories and they give you information. So the combination of jazz and film for me works very well. And, and of course there are some great films that do have jazz such as, um, um, I know this one with Sidney Poitier um, and Diane Carroll. I think it's something uh, blue, but if it occurs to me later, I'll give you the exact name. But if you put those two names in, it's a jazz film. And there's this exciting scene with Louis Armstrong comes uh, basically blasting through the door with his ensemble at this club that's run by Paul Newman. And it's just so exhilarating and, and so rewarding that, you know, things like that you want to repeat. Amazing. Yeah. Tell us a little bit more also 
about the Gusman and about the Hampton House and how you saw jazz and film plugging into those specific venues, which are like Miami icons, right? Okay, well, you know, some things are just uh, serendipitous luck or magic or just meant to be. So I ran a jazz series at the Olympia, the, at the uh, Miami Tower building. Uh, that's the building that's built like a three layer cake that lights up at night from 2005 up until August, 2013. Because they were renovating the space I was using, I had to go find another place. So I went to Robert Geithner and talked to him about wanting to use the lobby as a jazz lounge. And um, he got back to me and said, yeah, let's do it. So we've been there since, uh, I think, uh, October 2013 up to the, uh, the present. Um, the film series, I started 2010 at the Miami Tower building. And then when that same space was no longer available, we went to the uh, African Heritage Cultural Arts Center and I ran a film series there from September uh, of 2010 up until I think either 2016 or 2017. Uh, what happened was I went to Monaco with a blues band from Miami and uh, they played for Prince Albert in, at his Royal Automobile Museum. And uh, you can see a seven and a half minute video of the party scene. You'll even see me shake a leg with my daughter. Uh, it's called uh, Bolongaro uh, Expo. And just click on the long version. It's on YouTube. Okay. But what, I, but what I'm getting at is that, you know, you just do what you love to do. And you connect with other people who do what they love to do. And then next thing you know, you've got this phenomenal intertwining party and joy and and becoming. Amazing. Um, somebody here on Instagram also said that Street 54 is also a great, a great one. So I don't know if you've... Street 54, that's a, 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 a jazz club? Um, I'm not sure. Or a movie. Or a movie. Or a movie. Film, Maybe a movie. Maybe okay. it's a movie. Maybe it's a movie. Excuse me one second. I'm going to plug my phone in. <laughs> Streaming without a full signal. Um, okay, yeah, but I love what you're saying about loving what you do and finding other people who love what they do and getting together and that's when the magic happens. So you seem to be in that situation quite a lot. So how do you, how are you setting yourself up for that? Um, that sounds like it's, it's a bit of creativity. So we're here to talk about creativity and I, I'd love to hear more about kind of how you find those people. Well, I think you have to be uh, true to your happy self and just find things that you can handle that don't wear you out and stress you, uh, but uh, enrich you. So um, my background was social service for about 15 years. And at some point I burned out and I wound up doing security concierge, which was a lot much easier and, and less burdensome to, you know, to, my, uh, to my emotions and soul. Mm. And so it gave me a lot of free time to just kind of tune into what I delighted in. And so by doing that, I wind up running into situations and people where an idea occurred to me and I moved on it. So, um, so for example, back in Atlanta, um, I basically, uh, well, let me tell you about how I got a roommate in Atlanta, Georgia. Please. When I was in Atlanta, I ran into a guy named Phil Morrison. He's a bass player uh, that co-wrote a theme song for Nat King Cole, and he played with Freddie Cole's band. Anyway, um, Phil saw me in Atlanta, and he asked me, was I looking for a roommate? And I said, uh, uh, why do you ask? He said, I have a buddy in Boston that wants to move to Atlanta. So I called this guy Keith Williams, and uh, I asked him on the over the phone, what were his three favorite films? And he mentioned The King of Hearts, Harold and Maude, and The Thousand Clowns. <laughs> I said, okay, we can be roommates. <laughs> so we were renting an apartment, but we found a house with a large backyard and a, a back deck. And we invited 150 people and 300 people showed up. Wow. So there were Japanese cultural players, Brazilian martial artists, jazz bands, blues bands, folk, uh, horseshoe, badminton, and icebreaker so that people got a chance to you know, get to know each other. So that was June of 92. Then uh, 
July, people called us up and said, when are you having another Keith and Keith yard party? Huh? So we had one in August, and then the following year, we had four. And so this thing took on a life of its own. And um, one thing led to another. So from doing the yard parties, uh, I couldn't afford to pay each band that played party, but I put them in a rotation and I patronized where they were playing. So organically something evolved called Jazz Night Out. And that ran for like 24 consecutive months. Um, so from 92 to 98, I was involved in the yard parties in Atlanta. And, and in fact, Keith moved to Brunswick. He and Phil had moved to Brunswick. Uh, and we even did a yard party there with the Gullah uh, culture and people. And there was even a, an Asian orchestra that he had involved as well as his jazz. So that, you know, diversity was, was just beautiful and happening. So um, when I moved back to a Miami in 98, I went back to Atlanta doing yard parties once a year until 2005. Mm -hmm. And then I said to myself, this is nuts. I don't live here. I need to stop this. So then I introduced jazz to the Miami Tower building. And that's how I got started. I love that. That's such a classic entrepreneurial kind of story, which is you brought together the things you love and um, you saw a need and you, you had skills, you'd been practicing doing this and you found an, a new place, a new home for it. I think that's really, it's really tremendous. I would say there, you know, sometimes you just have to educate yourself and I guess uh, satisfy your soul. So if you're searching for something, tune into it and then try to give yourself what you need. Uh, there are a couple of books that were inf influential in my life. One was uh, uh, The Courage to Create by Rollo May, and he talks about five different courages, and, uh, and he explains why he thinks creative courage is braver than the other four. Uh, but when you're creating something, there's an intense encounter. Sometimes it can be rage, it can be elation, but there's a focus, and you wind up not focusing on yourself, but on the thing that you are in tune to and you wind up creating something, whether it's creating, you know, an insight, a solution or, or some art form. Um, another one was a book called On Carry, a different approach, but basically covering the same uh, area. And he talks about, there's a paraphrase in the book to say, when we, we find our place in this world, not through uh, explaining, uh, controlling, or being dominated, but through caring and being careful in return. And so you care about something, which can be an idea, a person, an object. Uh, you basically help the thing that you care about to grow in light of his own nature. So if you had a dog and you notice your dog delights in a certain uh, behavior or treat, then you wanna repeat that. Uh, so when you care, you find you have that other thing to grow. You're also actualizing yourself because you're not focusing on you. You're also finding the center of your own good. And there's some two other elements that I can't recall. Uh, and then uh, I guess uh, what got me started in Atlanta was um, even with the yard parties, but I had read a book by a woman named Adele Shilley and it was called Skills for Success. And I remember once when I lived in LA, I was working for the Martin Luther King and Legacy Association. And I shared the book information with a coworker and she said, oh, that's fantastic. Why don't we have the yard party? Uh, why don't we have the uh, network gatherings at my house? And that ran for 24 consecutive months. But, um, and then I would say finally, or maybe recently, but it's been a few years, there's a book called Now Know Your Strengths. And it says, when you find something you can do happily, successfully and repeatedly, uh, that's your, I guess, your talent or your gift or your calling. But mm. then if you add skills and knowledge to it, then it becomes a strength. Mm. And then you build your entire life on your strengths and the heck with your weaknesses, unless they sabotage, you know, your, your strengths, then you have to do something to minimize it. But you don't give the weaknesses strength. You give your strengths, you know, the strength. And that's what you keep focusing on. And hopefully those strengths include your joy because you're doing something you can do happily, successfully, and repeatedly. 
successfully does not necessarily mean money, but it means you have the confidence mm. to do something over and over and, you know, hopefully, you know, you enjoy it. So therefore, it's a piece of cake to want to do something that you enjoy doing. Absolutely. I, I love what you, what you just, you, you gave us a formula, right? So um, knowing your strength and finding the part of you that is joyful and feels awakened by purpose and then matching that with skills. And what I'm hearing from you is, is something I see in myself too, which is I don't necessarily have skills, but if I do a thing, I'm going to get the skills. So when you're talking about, you know, finding these opportunities to create kind of using the community as a canvas and using what you cared about as a canvas, you brought together that passion and those skills and nobody had necessarily said, Keith, I want you to put together this thing that's going to bring the community and film and music together. No one taught you how to do that. You just learned it. And that, that way you got the skill by doing. I, 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 I so identify with that. And I think a lot of creative people do. Yeah, I think you have to pay attention to the, whatever, the passion or the fire in the belly that you have. And then go with it. You'll learn as you get there. There's a saying that goes, you have to be a moving missile before you become a guided missile. Um, I think right. if you just, you know, another phrase is a leap and the net will appear. But you'll be surprised how things can work out. Uh, I mean, just think of back in your past when there are several things you thought, oh, my God, this is a disaster. This is the end of the world. And you survived it. So all you got to do is just keep on surviving, hopefully, as a happy, you know, being. I love what you're saying also because um, knowing your strengths is one thing. Knowing your strengths and being able to kind of double down on, on your strengths and hopefully that that is connected to your joy. Um, so when, and you gave an example of that, which was when you noticed that you were giving all of your heart and soul, something you really passionately cared about, um, in social services, but it just burned you out to give and give and give. So noticing where your strengths were and where your joy was, um, helped you also stop burning out. So being self-aware sounds like something that you're really also good at and that is a big, a big component that, that feeds you. Also, you have really good instincts and you recognize those. So if you were to give advice to somebody who was really looking for a way to, um, to better recognize their own skills and to know when an instinct is good, what would you say to them? Well, I don't know. I guess it starts off with uh, being true to your happy self. And nobody needs to tell you when you're happy and when you're not unhappy. <laughs> your, your, your emotions, your, your delight, your laughter inside will tell you, man, this is so satisfying. I am so happy. So when we have these jazz events, which I've had like basically like 30 different bands that I've placed in different venues. I've run a Latin jazz series in Mary Brooker Village for two years for people out of Puerto Rico, Ventana L Jazz. Uh, I've done, you know, other locations. I placed bands at the Intercontinental, at the, at the uh, Southeast Financial Center, and in the past at the Epic and other places. Uh, you just, you just do, well, first of all, I also love to serve. And I think that's important. Uh, there's a saying that goes, work, perform in the spirit of service is worship. And Bob Dylan said, you're gonna have to serve somebody, be it the devil or the You might as well serve something that brings you fulfillment as opposed to serving something that makes you feel, you know, <laughs> you know terrible inside. So um, if you love to serve, uh, and you realize that your service is benefiting somebody, at the same time as benefiting you, if it's what you love to do, then you just continue with it. That's so important and, and that really resonates with me. That really hits home. So thank you for that. There are so many directions that I wanna take this conversation just because I, I see you showing up in that spirit of service and in that mm -hmm. spirit of creativity. And um, you, 
you're always in the right place at the right time. And I don't know, you just, you have so many amazing qualities about you. I want to go back to that thing you were talking about, about um, the courage to create and how there's an intense encounter. So I think what a lot of people uh, kind of struggle with is a sense that they have something to share, but they're afraid it won't be perfect. So they kind of choke on it. And they're, they're kind of afraid of what might happen if there is an intense encounter as a result of that. Um, Brene Brown is a, a researcher and she has had several specials. Um, she's a very moving speaker. Um, but she talks about bravery and how if you're expecting to be liked, essentially I'm paraphrasing, like paraphrasing, I'm paraphrasing here, but if you expect to be liked for your gifts, it's not the right reason. And you're not basically gonna show up as your authentic self, but when you mm -hmm. actually get brave to what's inside you and you share it generously, like you're talking about, you know, the whole point is that that's you that's you sharing and, and serving i'm i'm really butchering it so forgive me Please no 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 it, me on this, but, um, it's resonating with me too what you're yeah. saying so i remember I listening courageous, right to really make an impact you gotta get yourself out there <laughs> i heard something on npr about a spelling bee and as a result of the virus uh it was canceled uh and these were like eighth graders and they were interviewing them and they asked the guy about, did he feel like he had to compete with the other people? He says, no, you're competing with the dictionary. Uh, we, we love being together and we know that it's our responsibility, you know, to, to be good at what we do based on the dictionary, not based on somebody taking something away from us. And I thought that was fascinating. But I would say that if, uh, I mean, for example, I'm not trying to play a, a saxophone or guitar or bass, you know, and I'm not envious of people. No, I delight in people mm. who have found their joy mm. and, and found their excellence and can share it. So in a sense, I'm like a a vessel or a, uh, a hollow reed through which the pith of self has been blown in which, you know, I see something that strikes me, then I try to create an opportunity. Um, one time I went to hear Leonard Pitts Jr. speak at the University of Miami, and it was on a fatherhood theme. And so on that program was a panel of these kids called Empower Youth. And they talked very matter of fact, without any kind of uh, bitterness, about the dysfunctional environment they grew up in. And something inside of me kind of cried inside and said, I've got to help these kids. I have no idea how, but I've got to help these kids. So we exchange information, and then it occurred to me, I'll let them host uh, a jazz series for me and a film series, right? So basically, we showed a movie called Babette's Feast. Oh, yes. And, uh, you know, here these are kids are primarily Black and Latino, and they're probably like for the age 12 to... 18, there may have been a couple of little nine, maybe like in their 20, uh, like 20 years old. So I showed this film and w while there, I also allowed them to have a light on in the rear of the place because they also made their own t-shirts. Well, there was a part of the film that had this incredible epiphany. If you haven't seen Babette's Feast, you have to experience it. Incredible. So, um, these kids were like, wow, wow. So I'm thinking, oh, they got what I got. I had no idea that I had tapped into something that was very deep for them. These kids wanted to have their own gourmet food truck, and, but I had no idea. So by them seeing, there's a scene where Babette basically um, is leaving. Uh, no, the sisters that she was staying with thought she was leaving. And they said, well, we won't be seeing you anymore. And she, and she said, why is that? Because you won all that lottery money in Paris. And she goes, oh, I spent all the money on the food. She had prepared this incredible seven course meal. And then they said to her, you, you silly child. And her response is, no, you don't understand. I'm an artist and cooking is my art. And these kids went, wow, wow, wow. Well, anyway, years later, um, 
not even years later, maybe a year later or so, these kids opened up their own 305 Vibe food truck at the Bayfront uh, near the sidewalk of uh, Biscayne and Southeast uh, uh, First Street. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was just absolutely amazing. And then another time I had them host a jazz event and a guy named Conrad Paschkutsky from Australia uh, played on the level of like Oscar Peterson. And at the time I knew him, I think he was like 21 or something at the University of Miami. Uh, so I had arranged that they would have a discussion during the break, that the trio would put certain questions to the uh, empower youth and vice versa. So Conrad says to the kids, he goes, uh, I disagree with Keith. Keith said that we have arrived. He says, you guys have your own t-shirts and you have some other things that you've made. So you're ahead of us. Mm. When we grow up, we want to be just like you. Mm. And that meant a lot to these kids because number one, if you heard the pristine level that Conrad played on, and th that those kids recognize it, this is not your sloppy, or mediocre or average player. This is like unbelievable playing. So it meant a world to them. And then one day when I did a fundraiser back in the day when Avenue 3 existed, uh, Conrad played and I had to empower you show up. So Conrad said to them, I hear you guys gonna have a, uh, a food truck. I love to come with my trio and play for you. And sure enough, yeah. Conrad who lives in New York came down, had a trio and played in front of their, their truck and it meant the world to those kids that an adult kept, you know, his or her word and really cared about them. Uh, Conrad's had something like nine albums out in uh, probably somewhere in uh, Japan and so forth. But he's, he w by the time I was in touch with him, he was a regular piano player with the uh, uh, Bucky, not Bucky, uh, John Pisarelli band. And also he traveled with his own trio to numerous countries within a year. So it's just an amazing human being. But the point is, you just gotta be your happy self. That's all you gotta do. I love that. That is so powerful. And I, I could listen to your stories all day. You have been in so many interesting uh, situations and people, people love you. And, and what I'm getting from this also is that you are such a generous person. You're generous with your spirit. You're generous with your caring. You were talking a lot about that. Um, let's see, to you actualize when you are, are sharing of yourself, when you are being generous, when you're thinking about somebody else and how lucky Miami is to have your big heart sharing generously and making these connections and holding space for people in their joy and in their excellence. That's just something I think is very rare. And I think that's something that, especially when we're thinking about you know, artists, I'm seeing so many artists being generous right now and thinking about how they can serve through their particular skills and talents. And that's something that you've been doing way before a pandemic, right? And I think it's right. such a point of pride for our community and it's super inspiring as well. There's so few people who are actually generous with themselves because they think that they're gonna lose somehow. That somehow if I share and I'm kind, um, I'll somehow lose out. And, and that's something that, you know, I've really been um, working on myself is like, I, I do this loving kindness meditation, that whole thing you were saying, like being a read through which um, cool things flow. Like I've been really working on um, or just allowing like love to pass through me in, in this meditation I do. So I, you know, being an instrument of love, being an instrument of, of, of generosity and kindness um, is something I think that we could use more more role models for. And so it's so inspiring to hear your stories and and to just get to know you. I, you know, we've just briefly encountered each other over the years, but um, a couple weeks ago, um, when you contacted me on Facebook, I was like, you know, here's a person who is so much in the kind of like, not the limelight, not the stage, but being that person making all of these amazing connections, you're like a catalyst. And mm -hmm. you're doing it out of that spirit of service. And I think that is so important for, for us to really absorb. Like, why don't, why don't more of us do this? Hopefully this can be a, a time when we, we have more folks that are stepping forward in that way. Um, Keith, I'm also wondering, 
Tell us a little bit. So um, the, the jazz series, the film series, they're going on regularly. What has happened um, during this time of the virus and what, what can people expect? Because they want to hear from you. They want to be back in the same room with you, but we can't do that right now. So tell us what's happening over there. Okay, so what's going on now, every Thursday from 7 p.m. to 8 p.m. on WDNA, <clears throat> there's a jazz program called uh, Jazz from the Hampton House, and the host and DJ is um, John Dixon. So uh, John was slamming last night, uh, and then the last two Thursdays. So WDNA 88.9 FM, uh, for one hour, you can hear artists that have performed at the Hampton House uh, between, I guess, 1954 and 1977. And then also, uh, since I've had a series uh, for two years at the Hampton House, 2018, 2019, as far as jazz and blues, uh, they'll play some music from those artists, such as Jesse Jones Jr. And look, we've got this young kid named uh, Miles Lennox, he was scheduled for April, but due to the bar situation, we've had to uh, postpone some things. But Miles, uh, at age 18, from Gillette High School, won the essentially Arlington Award for an original composition he did for a big band. Miles now has his own album out. So, and he's got like a, I think like a seven or eight piece band. Uh, one of those players in his band is a guy named Ian Munez, who I heard at age 12 through um, some uh, youth boot camp, a group of Nicole Yarley. Uh, when I heard him, it was like watching Michael Jackson and his brothers. I mean, this guy was way advanced to me over the other people in that ensemble. And there could have been like maybe 15 uh, people. So. During that break, I went directly to Ian and I said, I need to tell you something. Uh, can you get your father here? So his father came and I said, listen, I'm scheduling you. I think I, it was like six months in advance. I need you to put together your own quartet and you have to play with people that play on your level. If they don't play on your level, you know, if they're kids that can't play on your level, then you have to go with adults. But it has to be somebody, you know, that, that plays excellent because that's how you grow. You know, that's why Miles Davis was so amazing because he had John Coltrane. He had, you know, so many amazing musicians, a part of his ensemble, uh, Charlie Parker, et cetera. So anyway, um, so sure enough, as time passed and as a coincidence occurred, uh, Ian played for me for the first time with his own quartet at the Latin Jazz Series in Mary Brickle Village, and he knocked it out the ballpark. Uh, what really impressed me about him is his improvisation. He sounded like an adult when he mm -hmm. did ballads. He played alto, he played soprano, and he played tenor. But he did not sound like a, a child. And his improvisation was fresh and authentic and real and had surprise element to it, but, you know, happy surprise elements to it. Mm -hmm. So I think it's just a matter of, of you know, being your happy self and God will send people into your life and, and vice versa, you know. It's amazing. I feel inspired. I don't know if anybody else does, but it's it's so inspiring and amazing to to share space with you, Keith. And thank you. So WDNA Thursday nights from seven to eight, um, eighty eight point nine FM. And right. Um, you are also staying active on social media. And so where can people find you um, after this conversation? We'll, we'll put links in the show notes when we post on YouTube, but okay. just so the folks listening can, can find you. So there's MiamiJazzSociety.com. And when you click on that, it should take you to the website of Miami Jazz and Film Society. There's also uh, Miami Jazz and Film Society uh, on Facebook, and that should give you a schedule. So I have some things pinned on there now. Uh, uh, we're hoping some date in June to have something, something viral at both the Olympia and at the Hampton House. But, uh, and if you have some, you know, 
suggestions or if you want to participate with help us with some of this technology, you know, we welcome your expertise and your area where you want to be a part of this. Uh, do I have one more minute left? Yeah, you can tell us what you like to tell us. Well, when I think of community, I think of values. You have to have a value system. Okay, I believe in the oneness of humanity. I believe in equality of men and women. Uh, I believe in a harmony of science and religion. I, I just believe in universal progressive uh, thinking and living that is inclusive and yeah. allows space for everybody to be who they are. Yes. You know, be, instead of somebody conforming to what you think they should be. And also, I believe in don't waste your time judging people. Uh, just spend your limited time on this earth finding your joy and sharing it, you know, because human beings will always have imperfections. And if you just dawn on, if you just uh, focus on that only, uh, you're going to miss out on other things that that person can offer. So I know that sometimes you have to find the common ground. One time I did a program called the seven unifying functions of a family. And um, one thing I gained from that is that you know, I had more connection with my best friends or certain people than I did with my own family members. Mm -hmm. But instead of putting them down for being who they are, then just try to find a common ground, whether it's eating together or playing together or working together or child rearing together mm -hmm. or loving together, which means basically, you know, encouragement or, uh, uh, you know, worshiping together, which can mean anything. It could mean just studying ethics. It could mean deepening. It could be, it could mean, you know, going into a, a, a synagogue or, or mosque or, or church, but it could just, it could just mean being in the, the spirit of goodwill. So when you can find what you have in common with somebody, just, you know, go with that, especially with your family. Nobody in anybody's family, you know, is worth um, mm -hmm. disliking. People are who they are. Even if you have a relative whose values are, are the opposite of yours, you know, they are who they are. Just accept them for who they are, find the common ground, and, and then go with it. That's so, I'm so glad you said that because it's really like framing things in an asset kind of mindset, which is like saying yes and, which is what improvisation is about, first of all. And second of all, if you're really going to be inclusive, um, then you say yes and anyhow. I, I think mm -hmm. it's, you're giving us like little, the formula for the, for living a really happy life, which is understand your own value understand what makes you joyful and serve. And part of that service is, um, can be about helping to amplify other people when they're in their joy. And that really is, um, that makes you a happier person also, I think, to just let go what you can't control and um, just accept people for who they are. It doesn't mean they're perfect. It doesn't mean you're perfect, but the ride is gonna be <laughs> a lot more fun, it sounds like. <laughs> And there, there's so much tension right now and, and the, you know, really horrible things and systems and structures that are set up to really exclude people. And it's not, it's not something that we're going to change unless we come together and we are unified and wanting to change the systems and taking a stand and working together. And sometimes we have to be together, not in our joy, but in our outrage and in our, you know, willingness to be uncomfortable to make change. You know, sometimes when people aren't ready for something, they just can't move on it. And you just have to just allow people to be where they are. Uh, when I think of uh, one time I saw something where a black person befriended members of the Ku Klux Klan, and he was patient to let them be who they are and he had a way of just being who he was and next thing you know some of these people became friends and, and actually changed their way of being wow. uh, and, and left that organization but I'm not telling people what to do I would say uh, one time at one of my yard parties I had a lady named Beth Bowens who uh, was with a group something like a Bo Doctors Without Borders and uh, Beth was also at one point was uh, this is a, a white person who was voted Teacher of the Year at Morehouse School of Medicine. 
uh, I asked her if she could say something briefly at one of my yard parties just to give people some encouragement. And I'll never forget what she said. Uh, and this may have been way back in the middle of uh, uh, 1998 or something. No, it had to be before that because that's when I left Atlanta. But anyway, between 92 and um, 98, she said that the three reasons why people do harmful things to themselves and others, ignorance, illness, and immaturity. So if a person is ignorant, instead of you wasting your time disliking them, teach them wisdom or knowledge. If a person is immature, then demonstrate maturity. And if a person is uh, um, say ignorant, illness, uh, is Ill. ill, then, you know, then just demonstrate wellness. People can be ill for a variety of reasons. They may have had bad experiences, they've been jaded, and now they don't like anybody or they don't trust anybody. Or they grew up in a certain environment where they had no responsibilities and it was part of the culture of that family, you know, to, you know, be like sour grapes and put other people down just for being different. Mm -hmm. But uh, the idea is that, you know, the more you move towards your own wellness and your more and your wisdom and your maturity, you know, the better you are, you know, when you're dealing with other people, because then they start to model, you know, you're being uh, calm and patient and caring as opposed to, you know, just being impulsive and out of control. And that takes a lot of practice. It takes awareness and practice. So, uh, and, and you're modeling that for us all the time. So um, Keith, what a pleasure. Thank you so much. I feel like I have learned so many life lessons here as well as just general inspiration. So I thank you for coming on and sharing your big heart, your wisdom and everything that you've learned and all of your nuggets of advice. It's really we're very lucky to have you here doing what you do and, and shining brightly as you, as you do. So I wanna thank you for that. And everyone, I hope this has been a really thought provoking and heart opening interview. I hope you all take the time this weekend to stay creative. Thank you, thank you. And uh, thank you for being you. Oh, thank you. <laughs> <laughs>